welcome everyone. So excited to worship with you this morning. I invite you to lift your voice in praise. Come on, sing it out when you know it. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. Thank you, Lord. Yes. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadows, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. With my hands lifted high, oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll see through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. Come on now. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the Shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Oh, my fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. 
Come on, Trish, lift up a shout. That's right. Praise God. So good. So good. Well, welcome again. So glad you're here. I want to welcome all those online. In fact, church, can we welcome all those that are tuning in from all over the world? We literally see hundreds of people tuning in, and I'm so glad that you're tuned in with us today, and I'm so glad that you're here in the room with us right now. What an honor it is to gather together and worship the one true and living God. And I I love that song because it's true. You know, this world has so many things that just combat us, that come at us and combat us. And a lot of times, all we can do, and the best thing we can do, is to fall on our knees and pray to our God. And I think one thing around prayer that I've learned um, maybe recently on another level is that acknowledging God and his holiness, acknowledging God and his greatness and his all-powerful nature, acknowledging that, just acknowledging that first and foremost when you pray to God and you fall on your knees and you're in battle with whatever you're in battle with in this world, that acknowledging that makes whatever you're battling seem a lot smaller. And I think that's pretty cool. That's a pretty amazing uh, perspective. The Apostle Paul has that example even in Acts in the early church of of where he acknowledges the God that created the heavens and the earth and everything that is good. He starts off his prayers that way, and I love that. I love that so much. And even right now, as we continue in worship, we're going to sing about the holiness and the majesty of our God, and we invite you to continue in worship together right now with us. Come on, let's worship.
Lord God, you are so good. You are so good. Holy Spirit, you are so good. Jesus, Son of God, you are so good. The blessed Trinity, that's what we're singing about. That's who we are singing to. We're singing to you, the Trinity. God, I love it that you, you came to us in multiple forms as God the Father, as God the Son, and as God the Holy Spirit that Lord in our human nature, you knew that we would need different aspects of you, of your character, of your holiness, of your comfort, of your divine wisdom in different forms and, and, and through the Trinity, God, you've given us everything we need. God, as we sit in your presence, as we stand in your presence, as we're here intentionally this morning, God, wherever we are, as we are communing with you, God, I pray that you would open our eyes, you'd open our hearts, you'd open our ears to hear you and to receive you, God. I love that you say that you, you comb over the surface of the earth looking for those who are seeking you. And God, right now, we are seeking you. God, would you come, would your spirit rest here and with each person that is hearing this today. God, we love you and we thank you for your holiness and we praise you and all of God's people said, amen, amen, amen. You may have a seat. journey. So good to see you. Welcome to our Apopka campus, those that are in the room here at Apopka. Welcome to those at Lake County. Let's welcome our Lake County campus right now. Those in the room in Lake County and those in living rooms and recreation rooms and who knows what rooms online. We're glad that uh, you're joining us today. So good to be back with you today. Last weekend, I was in Kentucky with my mother. I'll show you this picture real quick. So that's mom, my older brother Rodney. This is the one we prayed about a, a lot, who had a liver transplant uh, almost three years ago now and uh, doing well, my sister Diane. And if you can look real close, my mom is holding a picture of our, my, my deceased brother, uh, David. So uh, that's the first time in 20 years that I've been with my mom and siblings on Mother's Day. So that was cool, and I just want to relay this to you for my mom. My mom says I look pretty. <laughs> and I, I said, I say, why do you say that, Mom? She said, because you shaved that old hair off your face. <laughs> so now I got that going for me. I want to give you a heads up on where we're going with the messages the next two Sundays, because they're going to be a little different than what we normally do. Today and next Sunday are going to be more of a Family talk than a traditional sermon. You ever have family talks in your family where you just kind of bring everyone together and talk about some important stuff going on in your family or things that will be happening that will affect your family? That, that's what we're going to be doing over the next couple of weeks. Now, if you're new here to Journey or maybe you're just checking out church for the first time in a long time, maybe ever. Let me just say, I'm so glad you're with us today. And I don't think you're here accidentally or coincidentally. You see, Jesus came not just to save souls, but to create a new kind of family. And this is a wonderful opportunity for you 
to see how a local church family like Journey deals with a momentous occasion. What I'm about to tell you is something that I've been praying about and planning for several years now. We're about to begin a new leadership era at Journey. And I'm so grateful and excited and truthfully, truthfully a little nervous to share it with you right now, but here it goes. At the end of December of this year, I will be stepping aside as the lead pastor of Journey Christian Church and Pastor Dustin Agard will become the next lead pastor of Journey starting on January 1st, 2023. Amen. That news may not be something you were expecting. And truthfully, uh, you don't know if you want to cry about it or something you want to cheer about. Maybe a little bit of both. And that's okay. Someone said leadership transitions are like attending a funeral and a wedding at the same time. And I think that's a very, very good description. If you will indulge me for a little while, I would like to describe how we got here. It's a really good story, but it definitely needs some context. I started seriously studying pastoral leadership successions when I entered my mid-50s. I knew at some point in the future I would step aside as the lead pastor of Journey, and I wanted to do my, I wanted to do my best to prepare myself, my wife, and Journey for that important transition. I love Journey too much and care too much about its future to do something that impactful haphazardly, half-heartedly, or hurriedly. Dave Travis is kind of a guru on pastoral successions, and he gave this great definition. Succession is the intentional process of the transfer of leadership, power, and authority from one directional leader to another. Journey is a large, multi-generational, multi-ethnic, and multi-campus church. A lack of clarity and direction when it comes to the future can cause confusion, and when people are confused, they will naturally come to their own conclusions about a situation, or as one writer put it, in the absence of information, people will connect the dots in the most pathological way possible. Translated, that means what people don't know, they make up, and they never make up good stuff. What I'm about to share with you today is a really good and exciting thing for Journey, but it will bring about some change, and change always brings some pain. Here's a sobering reality that we need to acknowledge. Every pastor is an interim pastor. Every pastor is an interim pastor, occupying their chairs for a season and then handing it off to someone else who will hopefully love it as much and take it even further than you could. Simon Sinek is a popular, inspirational and business writer, and he tells a great story about a former undersecretary of defense for the United States who was speaking at a conference that he'd spoken at the year before, but when he spoke at the conference the year before, he was still the undersecretary. And here's what he said. I love this story. He said, last year I flew here on business class. When I landed, there was someone waiting for me at the airport. They took me to my hotel. Upon arriving at my hotel, there was someone waiting for me. They'd already checked me in. They handed me my key, escorted me to my room. The next morning when I came down, there was someone waiting for me to drive me to the venue. I was taken through the back entrance. I was shown the green room, and I was handed a fresh cup of coffee and a beautiful ceramic cup. He then said this, this year I came back to this same conference, but I'm no longer the undersecretary of defense. I flew here on coach. When I arrived at the airport yesterday, there was no one to meet me. So I took a taxi to the hotel. When I got there, I checked myself in and went by myself to my room. This morning I came down to the lobby. I called another taxi to the venue. I came in the front door. I found my way backstage. Once there, I asked the tech if there was any coffee. He pointed to a coffee maker on a table against the wall. So I walked over and poured myself a cup of coffee in this styrofoam cup. He said this, the ceramic cup they gave me last year was never meant for me. It was meant for my 
position. The styrofoam cup is meant for me. Then he said, here's the thing about leadership. All the perks, all the benefits, all the advantages, they are not meant for you. They are meant for the position you presently but temporarily hold. And when you leave your role, which you eventually will, they will give the ceramic cup to the person who replaces you. Therefore, the best of leaders see their role as one of stewardship and are always thinking about what's next before they have to. There's an old saying among Marines in battle, if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. And if you're late, you're dead. It's never too early to develop a responsible plan to move the church beyond here and now to what could be and should be. To neglect to do so, in my opinion, would be to fail the most important leadership test every leader has to eventually face, the test of legacy. John Maxwell said, achievement comes to someone when he's able to do great things for himself. Success comes when he empowers followers to do great things with him. Significance comes when he develops leaders to do great things for him, but a legacy is created only when a person puts his organization into the position to do great things without him. And yet for all the talk in churches about vision, there's often a strange silence on the subject of leadership succession. Ignoring this blind spot can have disastrous consequences for a church. So over the past few years, I've read many books on the subject of succession. I've listened to numerous podcasts. I've read every article I came across, and I've had many discussions with leaders who've transitioned out of their lead role very well, and some not well at all. You see, wise people learn not only from their mistakes, but from the mistakes of others. And there are some major mistakes that have been made by many pastors of what were once large and thriving ministries that I wanted to avoid personally and for journey to avoid corporately. I even attended an outgoing lead pastor conference where all the attendees there had two things in common. Number one, all of us would soon be stepping aside in our role. And number two, we all wanted to do it in a healthy, Christ-honoring way. So today and next Sunday, we're going to talk about some of the specifics of how we intend to do just that, but I want us to begin today by helping us understand why we need to talk about transition in the first place. I'm going to give you five reasons. Number one, we're all aging, and a wise person faces their mortality realistically and thinks, thinks well in advance of exiting gracefully. John Ortberg tells a story about one of his daughters when she was much younger who noticed a Band-Aid on his arm and asked him about it. Turns out he just had a blood draw for a new life insurance policy. So thinking he would get some sympathy and admiration from his young daughter, he told her he just took out a life insurance policy that would pay their family $500,000 if he died. And she looked at him and said, a piece? I can remember years ago, the first time a lender required something called a key man life insurance policy on me because of the size of the loan they were making to the church I was serving at the time. The amount of that policy was so high, truthfully, I was afraid to be in the church parking lot alone in case any of the elders drove by. I could just hear one of them say as they mowed me down, greater love has no one than that he would lay down his life for his friends. <laughs> Long-term care policies and life insurance policies are taken out for a reason. I don't know if you know this or not, but the most recent stats on the current death rate is pretty impressive. One out of one. Now, while neither Melinda nor I are planning on dying anytime soon, some events of recent years in our personal lives have made us even more aware of the fragile nature of life and how suddenly things can change. It is good to think through things before you have to. I remember years ago, another trip to Kentucky, I was visiting mom and dad, my dad was still alive, and when I arrived at their home, 
They were wrapping up a meeting with a local funeral home director. They were making their final plans. It was a little awkward, but it was also assuring. I was proud of my parents for giving thought and specific instructions regarding their final wishes. And when my dad died a couple years later, things went pretty much like he and mom had planned. The great track and field Olympian Jackie Joyner Kersey said, it's better to look ahead and prepare than to look back and regret. Second reason we need to talk about transition. We tend to lose energy and our leadership edge as we age. I read about a study of over 1,400 managers in 200 corporations that found aging managers that they defined in their late 50s and early 60s are less willing to take risks the older they get and hold a lower view of the value of taking risk in general. I mean, come on now. For those of you that are around my age, isn't it true that many of the things that many of us attempted or tried when we were younger, we now look at others doing the same thing and think, what an idiot. <laughs> There's a natural tendency to draw back from making a bold move or taking a big step. The painful reality is that research reveals too many pastors stay well beyond their physical peak and creative best years, or as one pastor called it, their best by date. <laughs> I had a conversation with Dave Travis recently that I mentioned earlier, and he said in one study that they did while he was the executive director of Leadership Network, they found that only two churches out of 1,200, now listen, two churches out of 1,200 that had 2,000 or more in weekly attendance who were also multi-site and had a lead pastor that was 60 or older that was growing, only two. One retiring pastor said this, there are three ways I can leave. You can carry me out, you can kick me out, or I can walk out, and I choose to walk out. And it's a wise and rare leader who walks out while still on top of their game. I have learned that the best times for transitions are often disguised as the most successful times in our ministries. Third reason. Older leaders almost always lose the ability to inspire younger people even though they think they still do. Most pastors from studies that's taken years have been taught that they communicate well to people who are approximately 10 years older than them or 10 years younger than them. But when we start to get outside of that range, our effectiveness begins to see diminishing returns. Now, I know many pastors who think they are the exception to that rule and that they're just great cross-generational communicators and they connect well with all ages, but the truth is most of us are not. The greatest determining factor to the average age of a congregation is the age of its lead pastor. If you want to reach younger people and families, they're far more likely to be drawn to a pastor closer to their age or who can at least speak relevantly into their current season of life. One of our elders recently told me about a conversation they had with a newer attender who was in their 20s and she enthusiastically told this elder, I just love Pastor Dustin's preaching. He's so funny and engaging. And then she added, Pastor John's all right. <laughs> By the way, if you find out who that heathen was, you let... Make sure to let me know. <laughs> Even for those who truly are gifted cross-generational communicators, here's an important reality check. Look at this. The breakthrough ideas to reach the next generation are most likely not going to come from the previous generation. That's just the truth. The breakthrough ideas to reach the next generation are not going to come from the previous generation generation. We're seeing a great number of millennials and those coming after them dropping out of church at alarming rates. It will take an increasing number of biblically sound, gospel preaching, emotionally healthy, Christ-exalting millennial leaders and succeeding generations after them being raised up to the highest positions to lead their generations back home to God. Pastor Dustin shared an illustration 
that had a profound impact on our elders and myself at our recent elder retreat back in early February. Dustin was at a conference, and it was youth pastors that were at this conference at the time, a few years ago, and a woman, I think he said was from Princeton, that was giving a seminar, and she said, I want everybody in the room to stand up, and everybody stood up. And she said, now, when you can't hear, if you don't hear this next sound, I want you to sit down. It was a very high a decibel level noise. And so she turned it down and everybody 50 and older sat down. And then she turned it down again and everybody 40 and older sat down. And she kept turning it down until only people that were in their 20s that were standing because they could still hear the noise. And there are some things that only the next generation can hear and know how to respond to them to reach their generation, and our job as the previous generation is to train them well, cheer them on, and graciously get out of the way. I'm also aware that as we continue to emerge into the wild new world on the other side of COVID, many things will look different than they did before, much as our post-September 11th world differed greatly than the one we knew previously. The next 10 years of ministry will look much different than the last 10 years of ministry, and the church needs a fresh vision with a fresh voice to meet the needs of the demanding days ahead. Could I lead us through that? Maybe, but younger, smarter, more gifted people than me are available and ready to lead, and I thank God every day for that and I promise to do whatever I can to help them succeed. Fourth reason, when a healthy transition is made, the one step in the side has another chapter of meaningful life to live and finds fulfillment in that role. Every exit is an entry somewhere else. Every exit is an entry somewhere else. John Maxwell said, never leave something, go to something. There's a difference, he said, between I have to leave because I'm going to something else and I have to leave because it's over here and I have nothing else planned. I have given a significant amount of thought to what role I should play once I step aside both at Journey and beyond Journey. I want you to, I want you to hear this very clearly. At Apopka, Lake County, and online, Journey is and will continue to be mine and Melinda's church home. Paul said to the church in Thessalonica that they were so dear to him, he not only shared the gospel with them, but his life. And that is how Melinda and I feel about Journey. We have shared not only what I believe are my best leadership years with you, but we've shared our joys and sorrows and the blessings and the burdens of our lives with you, and you have accepted us and loved us for who we are as John and Melinda, and not just as your pastor and pastor's wife. That being said, it is wise and healthy for me and Melinda, for Pastor Dustin and his wife TJ, and for Journey as a whole, to have a, divine, a, a defined period of separation for a season that clearly marks the end of my lead pastor tenure and the beginning of Pastor Dustin's. Therefore, I will be away from journey in all capacities for a 12-month period starting in early 2023. During that time, Melinda and I plan to travel, spend some more time with our families, especially my 91-year-old mother in Kentucky and my extended family. Melinda has extended family there as well. My brother and my sister are bear the brunt of caring for mom. And if I can help in that time, I'd be honored to do that. I will speak at some other churches where I have relationships with some younger pastors that I've mentored over the years and see how I can serve them and their ministries. There are some ministry organizations that are close to my heart. I've been in conversations with some of their leaders regarding what someone with my experiences and gifts could do to help their ministry. Truthfully, I don't know exactly what my 
post-lead pastor role will look like. What I do know is I have challenged many people over the years to step out in faith and trust God with their future who were certain of a direction God wanted them to go, but a little fuzzy on many of the details. And this is one of those moments when I have to practice what I preach and demonstrate that I really believe what I've told others. It's a fascinating book I read after the outgoing lead pastor conference that Melinda and I uh, attended back in October of 2020. It's called The Hero's Farewell. It's a book that was written in the late 1990s by a Harvard business grad who wrote his PhD dissertation about how chief executives of Fortune 500 companies exit their roles. And the author identifies four basic departing styles of the CEOs from their organizations. He called them monarchs, generals, ambassadors, and governors. Let's take a look at that. Monarchs, he said, do not resign or retire. They die in office or are exiled through an internal palace revolt. Generals depart in a style that is also marked by forcible exit, but soon plots his return and quickly comes out of retirement in order to rescue the company from the real or imagined inadequacy of his or her successor. Ambassadors, he wrote, leave office quite gracefully and frequently serve as post-retirement mentors and governors rule for a limited term of office and then shift to other vocational outlets entirely after retirement. The point of the book is that a leader's late career self-image expressed in their departure style fundamentally influences the organization beyond his or her tenure and leaves a lasting legacy. I see myself as an ambassador. The author said this, ambassadors express the greatest career contentment on leaving a firm and greeted their retirement with feelings of pride and pleasure and I would add, great gratitude. That sums up my time as Journey's lead pastor and I will be the best ambassador for Journey Christian Church that I can be. After I step aside as lead pastor, the elders have chosen to give me the title Pastor Emeritus, which is a fancy way of saying we love you and appreciate you, Pastor, but you're no longer in charge here. <laughs> and I'm totally good with that. Emeritus is actually a Latin word referring to one who has earned his discharge by faithful service. It's kind of the opposite of a dishonorable discharge in the military. And I like these words that Paul wrote to Timothy. He said, let the, elders of, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. And I want you to know, I have been honored a thousand ways while serving as lead pastor of Journey. And when the title Emeritus was first proposed to me, I was hesitant to embrace it, but then I realized it was a way of being honored again, or you could say doubly honored Someone might well ask, well, is it even biblical to retire from pastoring? I think the answer is it is not biblical to lay down ministry to play golf or walk the beach with a metal detector for the rest of your life. <laughs> That's the typical American view of retirement, but it does seem wise and it is biblically warranted for a leader to shift the focus of their ministry to new directions. The Jewish priests in the Old Testament, for example, were commanded by God to step aside from leading in the tabernacle and the temple when they were 50. Not when they were worn out, but when they were 50. You can check that out. The Old Testament book of Numbers, chapter 8, verse 25. I think it's biblically supported and practically wise to shift one's focuses and hand off certain major responsibilities and see what God has in store for the next season of life. I say it like this, my calling hasn't changed, but my assignment has. I jotted down some quick thoughts, shared these with Pastor Dustin several weeks ago about what my post-lead pastor role could look like. I wrote down five things. Number one, less speaking from the stage, more teaching from the studio. I think online content teaching is going to become more and more important in our YouTube channels and social media platforms. More and more people check out a church by going online first. I think I can help with that. Secondly, less time leading organizationally, more time mentoring individually, particularly with younger pastors. Thirdly, less preaching, more writing. I think I have a book in me. I just don't know what it's about. 
Less being in charge, more being among. And lastly, less visibility at journey, more availability for the kingdom. There's another book that came out a few years ago that's been a big influence on many senior leaders. The book is titled Hero Maker. The idea is that everyone who leads imagines themselves as the hero who conquers evil, rescues from danger, and restores peaceful order. But behind every hero in the public eye, there's a hidden hero maker somewhere in the background who is the secret source of confidence for the hero's work. I have had some heroic moments in ministry over the last 42 years, and one of the top being this past Easter Sunday here at Journey. And I've also experienced some notable failures. But I would like to be a hero maker from now on. I hope that my ego can make that shift to step away from the spotlight and let someone else know the joys and the pains, the highs and the lows of leading a vibrant local church like Journey. The final reason we need to talk about transition it's for the good of the organization. I want you to listen to these words that Paul wrote to the Philippian church in light of this conversation we're having right now. Look at these words. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others in your relationships with one another. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And then Paul goes on to talk about how Jesus stepped down from his place in heaven beside the Father and Spirit and became a man who took on our sins to the point of death and then was raised back to life to the glory of God. Jesus descended into greatness and he gave us a model of how we should hold loosely to those things which we cannot keep in the first place and cling tightly to that which we can never lose. Bob Russell was a senior pastor of Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky for 40 years. Bob led an incredible ministry there that led thousands upon thousands to Christ and influenced an entire generation of pastors like me. After it was announced that Bob was stepping down as senior pastor, a longtime member of the church confronted the chairman of the elders in the lobby and demanded to know what the elders are going to do when the man who built this church is gone. And the chairman kept his cool and calmly replied, Ma'am, I want you to know that the man who built this church died 2,000 years ago, and his church will continue to do quite well because he's alive and he will still be with us. That's a good answer. <laughs> When Melinda and I got married on June 4th, 1983, we were married at First Christian Church in Russell, Kentucky. A preacher who loved and led that church for decades was named Pokey Miller. The whole town referred to that church as Pokey's Church. Now on the surface, that sounds endearing, but in reality, it is deeply concerning whenever a ministry gets enmeshed with the personality, style, and gifts of one specific leader. And I remember visiting that church not long after our wedding. They had called a new, gifted, younger minister to lead it, but Pokey and his wife, Nina, were still around. In fact, they were so still around that I watched the new pastor and his wife stood at the doorway of the worship center at one end of a hallway and Pokey and his wife stood greeting the people at the other end of the hallway. And I watched this family after family bypass the new pastor and went straight to Pokey to greet him. I was only around 22 or 23 at the time, but I whispered to, to Melinda, that new preacher's in trouble. He's not going to make it. And sure enough, he lasted about two years and resigned because he could never get out of the shadow of Pokey's church. I want you to know, Journey Christian Church was here long before John Hampton came along. And Journey Christian will still be going strong long after I'm gone. But that doesn't happen accidentally or magically. It happens intentionally as we plan to pass the leadership baton to a called and gifted next generation leader. And we certainly have that in Pastor Dustin Agard. 
The image of passing the baton is a popular metaphor in leadership succession writings. Every book I've read on the subject uses the relay race analogy when it comes time to hand off executive leadership. A solo runner can complete a mile in about four minutes. However, a relay team with each runner going full speed for a quarter of a mile can complete it in three and a half minutes. But the proper and timely passing of the baton is the most crucial part of the race. Relay teams practice it for hours. Dropping the baton is disastrous and destroys a relay's team chance at winning. The rules of passing the baton in a relay are as follows. Number one, the one passing the baton must keep running full steam until the baton is passed. You see, there's a temptation to let up because you're tired and almost finished, but though exhausted, the first runner must run full speed until the handoff is complete. Secondly, the one receiving the baton must start running before he receives it. The receiver does not begin from a standstill, but it's already moving and gaining speed. The intent is for the one receiving the baton to be going full speed when the baton is passed. Thirdly, both runners must stay in their lane. To step out of lines is to forfeit the race. Fourthly, the baton must be passed in a timely fashion. There's two distinct lines on the track that designate the exchange zone where the baton must be passed, meaning the transition cannot be extended indefinitely. There is a clear beginning and there's a definite end. If the exchange is handled properly, it's possible to gain a step in the transition instead of losing a step. Since the one giving is reaching forward and the one receiving is reaching back, there can actually be a jump step gained in the transition. And once the baton is exchanged, the one passing the baton does not run alongside the other runner coaching him, but stops, catches his breath, and walks across the infield to cheer for the successor, successor at the finish line. The ability or inability to pass the leadership baton successfully determines the ongoing success of the organization and the outgoing leader's legacy. I promise the elders of Journey Christian Church who employ me, Pastor Dustin and the rest of the staff who serve with me and you the members of Journey who follow me, that I will do everything in my power to finish strong while passing the baton into the capable hands of Pastor Dustin, who I truly believe will lead us further and faster than I can in the next five to 10 years and beyond. And we'll talk more about that in detail next Sunday. I wanna to end today by saying this. I have pastored churches and I have led church staffs for almost 42 years now. And here's one thing I've learned above everything else. Churches are filled with and led by people who need a savior. Churches are filled with and led by people who need a savior. The church is not staffed with super heroes or super humans. All of us are flawed. We're fallible and we're fragile because we're all broken humans for whom Jesus died and rose again. The church and this church belongs to him. What God started, he will complete because faithful is he who promised. This transition is not so much about grieving the loss of a leader or cheering for the next guy up as it is about fulfilling a mission, the mission of making more and deeper disciples of Jesus that love God, love people, and serve the world, remembering that leaders will come and go, but Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he's not going anywhere, friends. Jesus, Jesus still saves. The Holy Spirit still empowers, and the Father is still faithful. I said this when I started today. Let me go back to it. Leadership transitions are like attending a funeral and a wedding at the same time. But can I tell you something else I've learned? Every funeral and wedding Jesus attended, he did a miracle. He did things that surprised people. He overwhelmed their expectations. 
And I'd like for us to ask him to do that right here, right now, in this new season of succession. Would you stand with me right now? Lake County, would you stand with me? So Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to enter into new seasons, knowing that you are before us, you're behind us, you're with us, you're beside us. And everywhere we go, every way we go, you are with us, Lord. And we thank you for that. And I thank you that today we begin the announcement of that new era of what you are going to be doing at Journey. I am so thankful and I love so much my dear brother, Pastor Dustin. And I cannot wait to see what you are going to do through him as he leads Journey into the future. And I'm so grateful that you've given me the opportunity to do this. Whatever being a lead pastor is, that you've let me do it here at Journey, the church I always hoped you would let me pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus, keep leading us as only you can. Lead us, Father, to reach people we've never reached, to do things among us we've never seen done. We pray that now in Jesus' name. We all agreed and said, amen. amen. We'd love to help you take a next step. I know I heard some young man was going to be baptized, and uh, he asked about how he could go about that. We're here to help you with that. Maybe there's others that'd like to take that next step into the waters of Christian baptism. We're here. You just follow those folks right there as they uh, head on over to the baptistry. We'd love to help you. If you have another next step we can help you with, let us know. Journeychristian.com, next steps. flesh to save the lost grace and mercy displayed upon the cross our redemption he's the hope for all mankind one name over everything one name over everything Oh
In Spain, where Christopher Columbus died in 1506, stands a monument commemorating him. Perhaps the most interesting feature of the monument is a lion at the base, where the Spanish national motto is engraved. The lion's reaching out with its paw to destroy one of the Latin words that's been a part of the monument and Spain's motto for centuries. Before Columbus made his voyages, the Spaniards thought that they'd reached the outer limits of Earth, and so their motto was, no plus ultra, no further beyond. The word being torn away by the lion is the word no. So now it reads further beyond. You see, Columbus proved that there was indeed more beyond. And as we celebrate communion today, the bread and the cup, we remember that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection serves as our assurance, as our promise that for those of us who have discovered Jesus, we too know, well, that there's more beyond this life. And so as we take the bread and as we take the juice, let's not put our hope in the things of this world, but in the promises of God and the hope that comes through Christ. Let's celebrate together right now. Pray with me. Father, we're so grateful that because of you, we have the assurance, we have the promise that there is more beyond this life. We do not put our hope in the things that we see around us every day, but we put our hope in you and in the truth of your word and in the promises that you've given us. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, it was good to worship with you today here at Journey's online community. Wherever you're joining us from, please know that we are here to pray for you and to help you take whatever next step in your journey with Jesus you feel like you need to take. Let me encourage you to reach out to us through the link on the screen, journeychristian.com slash next steps, and let us know how we can assist you or help you or come beside you in following Jesus. And remember, you can keep up with us and all of our content on our YouTube channel, follow along with us, and our daily activities through our social media platforms. Again, thanks for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you right here next week.